Hello and welcome to another virtual edition of our educational programming. My name is Benjamin Wonderly and I work as a curator at the Maritime Museum. Today's topic is North Carolina boats, past and present. What I hope to do is give an overview of some of the various types of watercraft that have been built in North Carolina throughout the years. Of course, the original boat builders of the region would have been the native Indians. I have listed here the names of some of the groups that lived in Eastern North Carolina. The images show the process of how they created their dugout canoes and what they might have used them for. Eastern North Carolina was a difficult land to traverse. There were many bodies of water, large open sounds, wide coastal rivers, and even swamps. This is one of the only known drawings of an earlier type of vessel that might have been used by Europeans to traverse the shallow waters of the sounds and coastal rivers. It was called the Periauger. This is a historic replica of a Periauger that was built at the Maritime Museum's Watercraft Center. You can visit this particular boat today in Hertford in Perquimans County. One of the biggest things these early European explorers and settlers was excited about was the vast amount of timber resources in this new world. The different types or species of trees could be used for different parts of the boat, whether it was the framing or the planking or even the tall masts. The historic types of wooden boats that were made in North Carolina more than likely had origins from far off lands. For example, the surf boats that were used by shore based whalers along Shackleford Banks had origins in the Basque country in Europe. The vessels built in North Carolina served many purposes. This was an advertisement that appeared in the New Bern Sentinel in 1829 for a steamship that could transport passengers from Beaufort to New Bern. Shipbuilders were in high demand during the Civil War in order to build the most, what was then modern type of watercraft. This is a drawing depicting the construction of the CSS ironclad, the Albemarle, at Edwards Ferry on the Roanoke River. The surf boats used by the shore based whalers were also utilized by the life saving crews that were along North Carolina's coast. This image is of the crew from the U.S. Life Saving Station at Portsmouth. Simple watercraft like this flat barge were used for transportation means in order to connect the roadways of eastern North Carolina. This postcard image is from the Cape Fear River on the Wilmington waterfront. Without the timber resources, the ability to harvest fish would have been impossible. People still found time for recreation and pleasure as well. This is an image of a family outing on their sailboat that was built in Beaufort. It was a special occasion and everyone was dressed their best. Steamboats transported passengers, but they also helped move commerce up and down the coastal rivers of our state. This is the steamer Frank Sessoms that was built in 1894 Point Caswell, North Carolina. The watercraft built in this part of the state was also important for delivering the mail. This is the Jane Crabtree, which operated in the Core Sound area. These mail boats were commonly used between Moorhead City and Cedar Island, as well as Okokoke and Hatteras Village. From large steamboats, to small skiffs. North Carolina had it all as far as boat building. This image is from a hunting excursion 
that was taking place in Craven County in 1910. This slideshow would not be complete without mentioning the official state boat of North Carolina, the Shad Boat, and its origins in the early 1870s around the Roanoke Island area in Dare County. A sailing craft synonymous with the Carteret County region would have been the core sound Sharpie. But as mentioned earlier, boat builders often drew on other vessels from other places. And the Sharpie actually has roots in Connecticut, in the northeast part of our country. Here's an example of a core sound Sharpie that was built in Smyrna in 1891. The Bessie D was used to pull an oyster dredge and scrape up oysters off the shallow bottoms of the sound. A small flat bottom skiff was probably the most common boat around. They were relatively easy to build and most everyone had one. They were used for getting around from one community to the other. It was almost the equivalent of today's family van or station wagon or our modern pickup trucks. The term spritzel actually refers to the sail plan pictured here on this slide. As far back as the native Indians, boat building took place outdoors. This is an image of Creef Boat Works on Roanoke Island in the late 19th century. George Washington Creef is pictured second from the left with the long beard. Here's a later image of Creef and also a picture of him at his boathouse. He is synonymous with the development of the shad boat. Boat building was typically a trade that was passed on through the family, maybe from father to a son. C.W. Doe learned to build boats from his father, Otis. And Otis actually worked at George Washington Creef's boatyard. Here's an image of a work in progress at Doe Boat Works that was also on Roanoke Island, where George Washington Creef had his boat building yard. Here's a later picture of Lee Doe on Roanoke Island with two very nice examples of a North Carolina shad boat. While George Washington Creef was busy with shad boats up in Dare County, William Fletcher Willis was busy at his boat yard in Carteret County. The sailing vessel on the right is the Regulator that was built by William Fletcher Willis. William taught his son, Zephaniah, how to build boats as well. This one is the sickle that was built in 1910 at their boat yard on Jarrett Bay. Zephaniah is pictured standing on the deck of the sickle, his shirt sleeves rolled up. This list details some of the boats that were built by Zephaniah there on Jarrett Bay. The name, the type of vessel, the size, and when it was built. For some of them, we know the last year that they sailed. The Alfonso was Zephaniah's last boat, built in 1911. Here it is pictured on the Beaufort waterfront the following year. It has a load of fertilizer that was being shipped from New Bern to down east Carteret County. Some of you may actually remember the Alfonso. This image is of its resting place on Front Street in Beaufort, where it became the Museum of the Sea. It sat there along Taylor's Creek from about 1960 to 1978. Visitors could climb the ladder and go into the hull of the ship and look at curiosities and artifacts from the area. This picture is of Elmo Wade, born in 1885 in Williston. 
Uh, he happened to grow up across the road from Zephaniah's backyard. And I guess out of curiosity and maybe being a young lad with nothing much to do, started to hang out around the boatyard and eventually became Zephaniah's apprentice. Elmo became known as a master boat builder and his focus would be on the commercial fishing trawlers and Menhaden vessels. The list here shows some that were used on the North Carolina coast, but as well others that were used on the Gulf Coast. This is one of Elmo Wade's vessels that he built, the Bogue Sound that he completed in 1955 in Williston. It was used in the Menhaden fishery. In this picture you can see the large net that's being lowered into the purse sand to scoop the Menhaden out. The fish would be dumped in the into the hull of the Bogue Sound pictured here. This was an advertisement for the Diamond Shoals trawlers that appeared in the 1955 edition of the Carteret County News Times. It says that the sturdy craft were designed by Elmo Wade and have been tested and proven in our own North Carolina waters. In the newspapers, you can find all kinds of good information about North Carolina's boat building history. This is from the Wilmington Morning Star in 1918, where at the Meadows Shipyard in New Bern, they say that the largest tug in the state was built. This article from the same year in the State Journal touted the largest ship ever built in the state. The Dasalon that was launched in Moorhead City at the North Carolina Shipbuilding Company. This bottom image here shows the launching of the vessel. The top image is a picture of all the people that may have worked on the Dasalon in order to complete its construction. Another large shipyard that existed was that of Barber Boatworks in New Bern. In this picture, you can see the marine railways and the docks and the various vessels here at the mouth of the Trent River. You can also make out the Tryon Palace in the upper center. They built large boats and small boats. This is the construction of a 60 foot fire boat. And this is a small pleasure craft or runabout that was used for recreational purposes. I can't think of a better way to spend a summer afternoon than behind a barber boat. Pleasure craft or boats used for recreation seem to really be taking off around this time. This is an ad from the Carteret County News Times in 1955 that touts North Carolina's finest pleasure craft, Gulf Stream Liners, designed by Carteret County native Julian Guthrie. Tom Simmons made his boats down in New Hanover County. He was a cabinet maker by trade, and during World War II, he worked at the shipyard in Wilmington. He had made a few small lake boats for anglers, but in 1946, he got his first request for a commercial work boat or fishing boat. The end result was a small but stable craft that could be used on the Cape Fear River and in the shallow sounds for setting different types of fishing nets. The boat proved to be pretty, pretty popular among recreational anglers as well. Boats of all types and sizes were being built throughout the eastern part of North Carolina. At the Gillikin Brothers Boatyard on Harker's Island, they made 
small skiffs, and commercial fishing vessels. This picture in 1954 shows the launching of a recently finished cabin cruiser. The large gathering here made it evident that it was a pretty special occasion. The North Carolina boat builders never knew what they would get a request for. Nat Smith at Carteret Boat Works on Harker's Island ended up building two research vessels, the Cape Fear and the Raleigh Bay, used by the University of North Carolina at Wilmington. The early part of the 20th century may have saw the change of propulsion for these vessels from sail to gasoline engine. The latter part of the 20th century saw a change in the materials used. This is an earlier Grady White. They still make them today, but I don't think they use much wood anymore. Parker Marine is an example of a modern type of boat built in North Carolina. Some boats have already come and gone. You won't see any new Atlantic boats out of Kinston or the privateer from Bellhaven. It's a tough business to get into and you need to make a tough boat in order to survive. Some names you've probably seen around for a while. I tried to make an attempt at figuring out where some of the modern boat manufacturers existed in eastern North Carolina. Now I'm sure I missed a few, but this slide gives you an idea of the number operating in the eastern part of the state. So many boat builders have come and gone over the years throughout North Carolina. And the Maritime Museum has a special off-site storage facility where we keep some of these historic watercraft. We may have to expand because we have to ask ourselves, when does a boat become a historic vessel? This Philip Skiff out of Swansboro is no longer made. Does that mean that it deserves a place in North Carolina's maritime history? Thank you for watching this presentation. I hope that you've enjoyed this general overview and small glimpse into the rich boat building history of North Carolina.